Hey friends, how are you doing today? I hope you're feeling blessed and staying in God's presence. And if not, I hope you felt lifted after today's video. If you're new here, welcome to His Princess Christian Community, where we read a chapter of the Bible every day and then discuss it afterwards and in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow and it opens the door for more people to join our community. And while you're at it, check out the description box. We got a lot of great stuff in there. So today we're reading 1 Corinthians chapter 11, but before we get started, I wanted to say a prayer if you wouldn't mind bowing your heads with me. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together here on His Princess Christian Community. Thank you for opening the door for people to join our community, for connecting us and strengthening our bond. Thank you for opening our eyes, our ears, our hearts, and our minds to your word. Thank you for your wisdom, understanding, and clarity as we seek to interpret your word. And thank you for the courage to apply it to our daily lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I am so glad that you always keep me in your thoughts and that you are following the teachings I passed on to you. But there is one thing I want you to know. The head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. A man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. But a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without a covering on her head. For this is the same as shaving her head. Yes, if she refuses to wear a head covering, she should cut off all her hair. But since it is shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved, she should wear a covering. A man should not wear anything on his head when worshiping. For a man is made in God's image and reflects God's glory. And woman reflects man's glory. For the first man didn't come from woman, but the first woman came from man. And man was not made for woman, but woman was made for man. For this reason, and because the angels are watching, a woman should wear a covering on her head to show she is under authority. But among the Lord's people, women are not independent of men, and men are not independent of women. For although the first woman came from man, every other man was born from a woman, and everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without covering her head? Isn't it obvious that it is disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And isn't long hair a woman's pride and joy? For it has been given to her as a covering. But if anyone wants to argue about this, I simply say that we have no other custom than this, and neither do God's other churches. But in the following instructions, I cannot praise you, for it sounds as if more harm than good is done when you meet together. First, I hear that there are divisions among you, and when you meet as a church, and among you, when you meet as a church, and to some extent, and to some extent believe it. But of course there must be divisions among you so that you who have God's approval will be recognized. When you meet together, you are not really interested in the Lord's Supper. For some of you hurry to eat your own meal without sharing with others. As a result, some go hungry while others get drunk. What, don't you have your own homes for eating and drinking? Or do you really want to disgrace God's church and shame the poor? What am I supposed to say? Do you want me to praise you? Well, I certainly will not praise you for this. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. That is why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. That is why many of you are weak and sick, and some have even died. But if we would examine ourselves, we would not be judged by God in this way. Yet when we are judged by the Lord, 
we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. So, my dear brothers and sisters, when you gather for the Lord's Supper, wait for each other. If you are really hungry, eat at home so you won't bring judgment upon yourselves when you eat together. I'll give you instructions about the other matters after I arrive. Amen. So what did you think of 1 Corinthians chapter 11? I'm interested to hear about it in the comments below. Let me know what your insights or interpretations were on the chapter. Maybe comment your favorite verse or just say hi and let us know that you're part of the community. And if you need prayer, make sure you're putting that in the comments too so we can pray together as a community. And if you've been blessed, let us know so we can rejoice with you. Okay, so this is definitely something that is um, a topic of controversy um, and Again, I'm going to try to keep my personal opinion out of it and just speak to what the Bible says. And as Paul says in verse 13, judge for yourselves. Um, so you can judge for yourselves. Commune with, I definitely encourage you to commune with God about it. You know, speak to the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ and see what the Holy Spirit convicts you to do. Um, and, you know, I wrote that off to the side let the Holy Spirit convict you. Um, so, they're talking about the head of man is Christ and the head of the woman is um, is man and the head of Christ is God. And it's saying that um, a man dishonors his head if he covers his head while praying or prophesying. Um, and then it says, but a woman dishonors her head if she prays or prophesies without covering on her head, for this is the same as shaving her head. Um, so it's saying that the woman should have her head covered if she is praying or prophesying um, and it says if she refuses to wear a head covering then she should cut off all her hair but since it is shameful shameful for a woman to have her hair cut or her head shaved she should wear a covering um, so this is very to the point and um, to me my biggest question is I'm not really understanding the purpose behind it or the reasoning behind it um, I get that as he's saying that, he says, isn't it obvious further down, he says, isn't it obvious that it's disgraceful for a man to have long hair? And isn't long hair a woman's pride and joy? For this has been given as her covering. Um, so again, I'm not really understanding the meaning behind it or the purpose behind it. I never in Jesus' walk did I hear him talking about, um, you know, a woman's hair or a man's hair or you know the covering of their head I do know that it is in the Old Testament it talks about that in the Old Testament um, so I am very interested to hear what y'all have to say about it I would love to open up this discussion in the links down below um, I think that a lot of this is up for interpretation like it says judge for yourselves is it right for a woman to pray to God in public without her head without covering her head um, so again that's a question that I want to pose to you and just kind of get your interpretation on it. Um, again, it's something that I definitely need to spend more time studying. At this point, I'm not really understanding the purpose to it. Um, I understand the fact that you shouldn't sh a woman should not shave her head um unless it's like a vow you know i remember that from the old testament um when you when you break a vow you're to shave your head um but you know again i'm not really understanding the point of of this <laughs> so i'm just stumped right now really and I'm just not really understanding if this is more just for out of respect or reverence, um, protecting yourself, like you're, you're protecting yourself from, you know, outward influences um, and where the man is directly receiving from God. You know, I've, I believe that I've heard that before, but um, I'm just not so sure about it. Um, so I would, I'm very interested in, again, it's something that I want to pray on more and I'm interested to hear what your interpretations or opinions are regarding that. So definitely leave that in the comments below. Um, the next section is the order at the Lord's Supper. And, um, I think that this is so important that there are certain things that we do in remembrance of God and we have to do it out of reverence. And I think it's more than just the Lord's Supper. It's when we gather together. Um, you know, I know that there's a lot of times when you know, there's a rush to the parking lot after church, um, you know, with communion, 
there's a rush to take communion. I've even gotten confused in, com in communion sometimes at church where, you know, they'll say, go ahead and take this and I'll take I'll the, both the bread and the drink. And then I didn't know that I was supposed to wait to take the drink till later. So communication is key. Preachers, pastors, when you are, you know, hosting communion, make sure you communicate only dr take the bread, only drink the drink, you know, so that you know what you're supposed to be doing, when you're supposed to be doing it. Um, but I definitely think that we need to have reverence for God and um, be patient, wait patiently and spend time in church. Don't be in such a rush to leave, you know, make sure you're communing with, you're have fellowshipping with your other um you know, your fellow Christians and your brothers and sisters in Christ. I know a lot of churches now have like little cafes inside their churches. Um, there's little sections where you can, seating areas where you can sit down and maybe talk about the message afterwards. Um, you know, I know that it's not um, the same where they actually are eating supper. I know that some places have dinner services. So again, don't go there so hungry where you're rushing to eat and then leave. Um, make sure you're actually spending that time, you know, in fellowship and in communion. And again, as you are, um, it says, the, the very last part says, examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking for the cup. For if you eat the bread and drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. Um, so I think that it's very important that when we do do communion, we're spending time um, examining ourselves and, you know, making sure that we're confessing sins. Do we have unforgiveness in our hearts? Um, is there anything that we need to, you know, confess of? Um, is there anyone we need to forgive or we need to ask for forgiveness for? Um, you know, these are things that we should be doing as we are, you know, practicing communion. We need to um, perform our communion with a clear conscience. Um, and it says we are being, so it says that, um, yet when we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Um, so remember that when God does discipline you, it is an, it is a loving discipline. It's with love and in order to refine you, purify you, to prune you, and to correct you. A lot of people I've noticed, um, I've heard a lot of people say, well, God doesn't discipline. He doesn't punish you. People don't like to say the punish. They like to say discipline um, because they say discipline is more of a correction um, or they they like to say correction. Um, to me, it's kind of like all one in the same. Um, but, you know, whichever term you like to use, um, I'm not sure. I'm going to check the other ver other translations to see what term that they use. But, you know, discipline to get you in line, to make you practice a particular, um, you know, self-control whatever it is that they have you. God is doing that out of love for you so that you will not be condemned along with the world. So you will not lose your salvation. So we need to accept that discipline um, with a loving and willing heart. And we need to ask God if we're not easily corrected. I know I haven't always been easily corrected or disciplined. It's something that I had to pray on daily. And I still pray on daily to be receptive to God's instruction, to his correction. And I think that's something that we all need to do because when we do um, come to to God, we want to make sure that we have, again, a clear conscience. So we need to be receptive to his correction, his discipline, his pruning, and we need to be open to confess any of our sins so that we can be blameless before him and make sure that we are forgiving as we want to be forgiven and we're asking for forgiveness where we need it. So that is my interpretation of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I'm interested to hear what you have to say about it. Leave it in the comments below. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And I hope you stay blessed, stay in God's presence, and have a great rest of your day. I love you.